How do we find a way forward in a society that is mired in an epidemic of narcissism and struggling with radical economic inequality? Welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. In this second of three episodes, we expand our discussion of narcissism to more fully understand what it means to individuals and to our society. We're going to return to a conversation we had with Dr. Sheldon Solomon a few weeks ago. We asked him to elaborate on his ideas about narcissism and its dangers. In this episode, he lays out the fundamentals and the impact narcissism has on economic inequality. In the third and final installment, he extends the concerns into other areas and we explore opportunities for hope. Sheldon Solomon, Ph.D., is a social psychologist at Skidmore College. He is best known for co-developing terror management theory with Jeff Greenberg and Tom Pasinski, which is concerned with how humans deal with their own sense of mortality. He is the author or co-author of over a hundred articles and several books, and has been featured in several films, television documentaries, and radio interviews. He co-authored the book The Worm at the Core on the Role of Death in Life with Greenberg and Pasinski. He most recently appeared in the documentary Planet of the Humans. Here's the conversation with Dr. Solomon. We're recording in Ken Swain's cottage. living room in this cottage. And we have with us our friend and mentor, Sheldon Solomon. And we're thrilled about it, I, beyond I, belief. Oh, it's great. It's my birthday weekend, and this is the present I would have asked for. Happy birthday. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Happy yeah. birthday. <laughs> Birthdays are much more fun on the first half of life. Yeah, that's Before what you cross say. that 50-yard line. Once you're in the fourth quarter. We're in the fourth quarter. You could just skip them, as far as I'm concerned. It's just <laughs> one more nail in no, the... No, 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 no. Thousand clowns. Remember thousand clowns? Yes, you gotta, I do. You got to count your birthdays. You got to count every day. Well, they just go right by. I know. Uh, so, yeah. So They're happy, going. So happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Sheldon, welcome to The Hub for Important Ideas. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ken. I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you for making this, this trek out here. We really appreciate it. It's, it's awesome. It's and it's so great to see you again. So, Sheldon, we've been talking over the last few days about narcissism. And that's a term that has really come into public discourse with the rise of, of Donald Trump, but also because of the number of studies that have been done recently. And you pointed out a book written in 1979, which is kind of incredible. Would you tell us, first of all, what is narcissism? And is there, in fact, a narcissism epidemic in America? Yeah, I'm happy to take a, a shot at it, uh, Stephen and Ken. Just to second what you said a moment ago, I, I do think it's uh, the case that the term narcissism has become particularly prominent right now in public discourse, and that is at the very least an accurate reflection of the idea that there's current concern about it. And you're also right to note that this is not new. That, you know, we got 40 years ago, uh, Christopher Lash wrote a book called The Culture of Narcissism, arguing that there were historical and psychosocial factors that made it such that narcissism, which has existed since time immemorial, was now becoming more prominent and potentially more perniciously problematic, both in terms of the effects that it might have on individuals, and perhaps more importantly, on the effects that it might have on societies writ large. And the basic take on narcissism at the risk of degenerating into psychobabble, we should always define our terms. And I think there's in general consensus that a, a narcissistic individual can be characterized by a pervasive sense of grandiosity and self-importance that is juxtaposed with a persistent and incessant need to be seen favorably 
by those around them. And so really two components. Uh, one is uh, I'm the best, fuck the rest. The narcissistic individual is uh, one who perceives he or she as uh, pretty much larger than life and superior to those around them. And so that's the one part of it. And then the other part is the interpersonal demand that you not only need to be admired, in fact, more than admired, essentially worshipped by those around you, but you need it and you demand it of other people. And so that's kind of the basic conception of narcissism. And you lack empathy. Oh, absolutely. And so let's on top of that. In addition, we need other people to admire and respect us, um, but that's all we need from other people. And in fact, we have no inclination or a capacity for that matter to return that favor by having any pretense of concern or, or compassion for those around us. And less regard for the common good. Oh, absolutely, because there's no such thing. <laughs> What's hard about this, and this has been one of the things I've enjoyed about, are just dancing around these ideas. What's confusing, and understandably so, is that you hear the word narcissism, and immediately you're like, wow, that's got to be bad. Because, you know, when you declare somebody narcissistic, you usually say it in a tone that's like, you know, gallons of pus being exuded from all of your bodily orifices <laughs> simultaneously. Uh, and, uh, and so like, oh, what a fucking narcissist. But Freud, Ernest Becker, Ken, <laughs> yesterday, pointed out that narcissism is quite natural biologically necessary, and in at least in the early part of our lives, it's quite universal. And necessary for your survival oh, when, you're, when you're little. For your survival, for your psychological well-being. And here's where it gets at least cumbersome to talk about, because we need to come up with a way to say that developmentally, we all come into the world narcissistic. We are, after all, profoundly immature and dependent at birth. That renders us predisposed to anxiety. And we've had this talk over the years. You know, we are at birth, you know, respiring pincushions, completely incapable of engaging in even the most rudimentary instrumental behaviors. Therefore, our only recourse in times of need or distress is to start fucking screaming as loud as we can, and that summons the magical assistance of our ancestral forebears. And, well, from the phenomenological perspective, the newborn, there is no one else in the world but oneself, and, of course, any distress leads to the crying and screaming that on a good day is rectified by the parental overlords coming to rectify your circumstances. So it sure seems like the world is constructed for my immediate benefit. And I certainly don't come into the world with any broader concerns about the well-being of my fellow humans or the social environment. Which is why narcissists appear to be childlike in some ways. That's exactly correct. That's exactly right. And so here comes the developmental inflection point. And I like how Karen Horney puts it. So she was an old-timer. In the 1940s, she wrote a book called Neurosis and Human Growth. And what I like about Horney is that she is not a simpleton. She basically says that we all come into the world with a kind of kernel of an authentic self. She calls it the real self. And she says, this is what uh, we might, under the most favorable of circumstances, naturally become. Very Maslow, very like, put the acorn in the ground. 
and it gets sun and water and fertilizer and a, a lovely oak tree might it become. You plant it in the parking lot and put dog shit on top of it. Not so good a tree. And her point is that, yeah, but th that doesn't happen because the conditions necessary for the development of this so-called real self is an atmosphere of pervasive love and security in childhood. And she goes on to say that that would be great, but it's not possible. Uh, life has a way of impinging upon us. Our parents' own psychological insecurities will render them, even under the best of circumstances, incapable of being anything but human, and therefore, inevitably, as infants, we're going to experience what she calls basic anxiety. Right? Note that this is it's no different than Bowlby talking about anxiety as the impetus for the formation of attachments. It's no different than Darwin saying that humans are uniquely predisposed to be anxious. It's no different than when Becker talks about how the world of the infant is not just Walt Disney like positivity, but rather there's lots of nightmarish and negative intrusions. Well, Horney says, okay, so what happens with this so called basic anxiety? And she argues that that is the impetus for the construction of an idealized and glorified image of ourself that she calls the ideal self. And her point is that the ideal self serves as a proxy. It's not what we are. It's what or who we wish to be. And that the primary function of the idealized self is to ward off anxiety by giving us an ultimately fictitious sense of self-regard. But this is normal, healthy, uh, what we consider normal, it healthy is, development. development. It is normal, healthy development. And now the issue for Horni is... What happens thereafter vis-a-vis -vis the dynamic relationship between these two different selves? And she says, well, one possibility is that this so-called real self ends up getting the psychological upper hand, and these idealized aspects of ourself, which all of us have, are somewhat suppressed or diminished. Right, on the other side of the psychological spectrum is when the idealized self literally dominates and replaces all vestiges of this so-called real self and becomes the be-all and end-all of our psychic existence. For Horni, this is a tragedy because you spend your life whether you're aware of it or not, psychologically preoccupied with maintaining this grotesquely overinflated image of yourself at the expense of becoming who you are. But that's not necessarily your choice. That might be because you're just trying to survive is, in a dysfunctional family with absolutely. a sociopathic father like Donald Trump. Yes, did. could also be temperamental to begin with. So here... Right. Uh, at what I was looking up, you know, temperamental uh, meaning genetic, bi biologically predisposed. Right. Gotcha. So uh, we know, for example, that the heritability quotient for pathological narcissism is relatively high. English translation: If you have identical twins that are separated at birth and reared in radically different cultural milieus, if one twin is pathologically narcissistic, the other is more likely to be. Right. It's not 100%. If it was, we'd be done talking because that would be end of the story. You know, it's like sickle cell anemia. You either have it or you don't. So what this tells us is that there is a biological predisposition to become narcissistic in the unfortunate sense of the word, but it must also be stimulated by adverse psychosocial circumstances that we need to talk about. Okay. 
Go but, ahead, Steve. Okay, but what we're reading now, what we're seeing, are studies that involve, I think it was like 35,000 people. And they're saying the results of these studies are showing there's a rise in narcissism in our society, particularly among millennials, yeah. which is very problematic because the young seem to be more narcissistic. When you think about it, the generations before us were devoted to winning the war collectively, working together to win the war. So the focus on the individual was greatly reduced. But now the focus is on the famous person, the arrogant person, the loud person. And that's who we emulate. That's who we reward. We, we, we noted the, uh, the study of narcissistic posts on Facebook get more likes, which to me is completely counterintuitive. When I encounter narcissism, I cringe. And yet, in our larger society, it's admired. It's revered. If it's genetic, okay, but why would there be what some people are calling an epidemic of narcissism? It would be because the culture itself maps onto the very attributes that are clinically manifested. And so maybe let's get there by making the distinction between narcissism and genuine self-regard. Does self-esteem. I, yeah, or self-esteem, yeah. And again, I, at the risk of being redundant, what we want to have it both ways. And we want to say that, yeah, we all come into the world fundamentally narcissistic. We all come into the world wanting other people to perceive us positively. But now what happens such that some people end up being malignantly narcissistic, while others end up being, relatively speaking, more in possession of genuine self-esteem. And noting, I think, one of the things that I like about Horni, and I'm not being very uh, linear or orderly today, but no matter, Horni insists that we are all simultaneously genuine individuals, real selves, as well as neurotic caricatures of ourselves in the form of these idealized images. So when you ask the question, am I narcissistic or do I have genuine self-esteem? With all due respect, that's the wrong question. The question is, what proportion of my time and psychic life is being ultimately determined by which aspect of these selves, which are always simultaneously operative in dynamic tension. And in that sense, personality is better seen as an ongoing process rather than a set of static attributes. All right, so be that as it may, Horni goes on, and you'll notice that she's just going to end up with the definition of narcissism that uh, I was spouting at the outset of our conversation. She's like, well, all right, let's just compare. And I think for our purposes, let's go with three points of comparison. And she says, first of all, that there's a completely different emotional or attitudinal tone between narcissism and genuine self-esteem. And she describes it in terms of arrogance versus humility. She says, look, what really, when you look at the narcissistic individual, what you find is that their self-regard is completely contingent on being better than those around them. I'm the best and fuck the rest. And what she also notes is that a good way to determine that is to watch what happens under two conditions. One condition is, well, what happens when a narcissistic individual is challenged 
by somebody around them. So I tell a story in my Skidmore classes that when I got to Skidmore, it's actually from my college days, and it really doesn't matter, but you guys are old enough to remember the Grateful Dead days. and there was, Sort of remember that. Yeah, sort of. But anyway, narcissistic son of a bitch is a Grateful Dead fan, and he prided himself on I know every Grateful Dead song. Not only that, but if you play a song, I'll tell you what concert it was performed at, and I'll tell you what Jerry Garcia wore that day while he was playing the guitar. (laughs) All right, so anyway, the point is uh, some other kid was visiting from another school, and in the Dr. Tune, we used to call him, you know, the Grateful Dead song comes on, And he's like, well, that was uh, at Red Rocks in Colorado. It was August so-and-so, 1972. And this other guy, who was just a nice guy, he's like, you know, no, I I was at that show. They didn't play that song. All right, well, basically, this Dr. Toon guy gave him one of those death looks and just said, how fucking dare you? challenge my ultimate authority. One of the ideas that I like about Karen Horney is that she's like, look, a good marker that something is happening is when an emotional reaction is in vast access to the circumstance that provoked it. You know, in other words, this guy didn't say, oh, you're a fucking idiot. He just mentioned in passing that something might be factually incorrect. And Horney's point is that the narcissistic individual is so dependent on other people's unanimous approbation that they respond with anger and vindictiveness whenever she calls it a neurotic claim, whenever it's not met. So she's like, well, that's one way to tell uh, that you're dealing with a narcissistic individual is they've got to be better than other people. And they really respond vigorously and angrily when somebody doesn't can corroborate their idealized image of themselves. And then the other thing is that they cannot tolerate being in the presence of somebody who's demonstrably superior to them. Like, that would be the worst. Right? Like, and then like, she's- like being Donald Trump in the presence of Barack Obama. Correct. Or Michael Bloomberg, somebody with actual money, let's say. Yeah. All right. And then she says, okay, let's go over to the other side and let's talk about genuine self-esteem. And her point is, is that, well, if you've got genuine self-esteem, you are, that means you are comfortable with yourself. That means that you feel fine about yourself but it doesn't mean that your sense of self-worth is predicated on your superiority to others. But now, when you spoke at the New York Society for Ethical Culture, was it 2015, 2016, before the election, the whole issue of narcissism came up, and someone asked, was narcissism self-esteem? And you raise a very interesting point, saying... Narcissism may look like self-esteem. Yeah. And if you do one of these basic questionnaires, you'll hit all these high marks as far as self-esteem. But implicit self-esteem is lacking in the narcissistic Yeah, that, that's correct. Uh, so what we want to note as we, tr- as we trot through these horn eye things is that the narcissistic individual is driven by efforts to minimize basic anxiety. It's a defensive reaction because the goal is the preservation of an idealized and ultimately fictitious image. You're an expert on Ernest Becker. We're big Becker fans. And of course, terror management theory also says that self-esteem is a primary defense against death anxiety. That's right. How about narcissism? Is that a defense and is it, a, is it a, an effective defense? Yeah, well, no, it is a defense and it is a profoundly ineffective one because the narcissistic individual, as we'll see, is persistently insecure and it's ultimately unstable because it's always contingent on constant approval. 
Uh, so let me barf up the other two things, and then let's come back to that. So we've got the idea narcissists are arrogant, genuine self-esteem is humble. And Carlos Castaneda, you guys remember him yeah. from the old days. What a dick. So I love his books, but he was a fraud. He never left his room in <laughs> UCLA. But I didn't know that. all right, frauds are people too. And I love the Don Juan uh, quote where, where he says, the average person seeks approval in the eyes of others and calls it self-confidence, whereas the warrior seeks approval in his own eyes and calls it humility. That just sums it up. And but live with death at your elbow. That's correct. Yeah. So again, these guys had it down. All right, so we have arrogance versus humility. And then the, the next point of comparison uh, is hypersensitivity and ultimate receptivity to constructive criticism. So the point is, Horney says, look, the narcissistic individual has no desire to change. They are already legends in their own mind, and therefore they vigorously resist and are actively hostile to any kind of inference that they might be other than perfect. But now you send us this article, which was real eye-opening for us because we had never heard the term collective narcissism. Yep. And that really hit home because I thought about this statistic that we've trotted out before that well over 40% of white Americans believe that they are discriminated against because of the color of their skin. Now, anybody who thinks about that for very long starts to say to themselves, well, wait a minute, you mean they look at affirmative action as an action against their group? They look at one in a million white people not getting the job because a black person got it. They see that as discrimination. And I thought, wow, that's like collective narcissism. Yeah, that would be the resistance to constructive criticism and a defensive counter punch, psychologically speaking, to that. So, yeah, absolutely. And again, move to return to that. So you got the narcissist saying they are adamantly opposed. They can't be wrong. And, you know, we don't want to make this only about Donald Trump. And yet, for the average person that, that may be listening to this, when we talk about individual narcissism of a particularly malignant kind, well, Trump is the best of examples. I forget which Harvard professor, famous psychiatrist, said, I will no longer have to work very hard to talk about pathological narcissism. I will show them five minutes of Donald Trump at random, and that will do the trick. Because here's somebody who is viscerally incapable of being criticized, always denounces people who do that. Because again, I'm the best, only I can do it, and that's all there is to it. All right, genuine self-esteem. People with genuine self-regard are all too human. They don't necessarily like it when they are criticized. But have you ever been, uh, you know, this is a rhetorical question, but feel free to jump in. Have you ever gotten negative feedback that your immediate reaction was like, fuck that, but you calm down maybe a couple of minutes or years later, and you're like, wait a minute, they're right. They were right on the they money with right. that. They were right. With Horni, because, and this is because of you, Ken, and I mean this in a compliment, when you put things on a continuum, you're acknowledging that it's not either or. Yeah. And so, frankly, anyone who declares with a straight face that you are unencumbered by any hint of narcissism, with all due respect, you're either a saint or a sociopath. Because all of us, from time to time, if we're human, we're anxious. Right. If narcissism is a defensive reaction to anxiety, then we all must be affected by it. Yeah. 
to varying degrees at varying times for varying reasons. One of the things I wanted to point out when Steve was talking about, he, he doesn't understand why social media favors narcissistic posts. I think it's very closely tied to why Donald Trump was so popular among his supporters. And that is that people, all of us, myself included, take cues yep. from the subject matter that's in front of us as to what its value is. That's correct. Like we and, were talking about yesterday, it's a, it's a multiply, it's a mood multiplier. Right. And one of the things I wanted to tell you about this was the article I was reading this morning, and I love this analogy. They talked about narcissism as self-esteem addiction. Oh, that's that, a good one. That the narcissist, we all have to feel good about ourselves. But for most of us, from time to time, we do something and we feel good about ourselves. Yeah. The narcissist's need for feeling good about themselves is ubiquitous. It's insatiable. And it's insatiable. So when you see on social media the blatantly narcissistic post with a lot of these likes... Yeah. You know, that's a shot of dopamine right into your forebrain. Right. And it's like monkey see, monkey do. And you you make the assumption, correctly or incorrectly, that, right. that this person wouldn't be acting this way if they didn't have something behind it. Why would the guy walk into the room and declare, I'm freaking awesome and all of you guys should fall down? A lot of people go, really? Wow. Until I know otherwise, I'm going to get in line because this guy seems to know what he's doing. That's what Trump does, and that's why the social media posts get more likes when they're narcissistic, because people look for a clue, and frankly, someone beating on their chest and saying, I'm awesome, like my page, a lot of people will just do that. We're sheepish in our following. We are, and our culture is narcissistically oriented to idolize, to reward the arrogant brash, bold person, starting with Muhammad Ali, who I loved, yep. Joe Namath, who I couldn't stand. Yeah, I didn't. But they started this whole thing about the brash, arrogant athlete versus Joe Lewis, John Unitas, who just said, no, it's my job, you know, I'm- Lou uh, Gehrig. Yeah, yeah, Lou Gehrig, exactly. Very they, humble, yeah, unbelievable they, hitter. Yeah. The, the idea of doing a dance in the end zone was so foreign- to the 1950 football player that if you, in that era, if you had done a dance in the end zone, they would have crippled you for life on the next play. No, right. You will never do that again. Right. Right? But now it's like, It was so commonplace, they had to fine them because they would spike the ball into the ground and it would bounce into the stands and they'd have to get another $40 (laughs) football out there. (laughs) But every awards show, like there's an awards show every three weeks, Somebody's standing up going, I, 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 me, 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 I deserve this, this statuette. I did. It's like over and over and over again, the same thing. And then reality TV, Dancing with the Stars and Survivor, it's like, I, 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 me, 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 oh, I'm going to cry now because of my mom. And, and you go, get over yourself. I can't listen to this anymore. But it's but on constantly. Because that's what people want to watch apparently you're you're not the target audience the self but think about that self-standing person but that can in, see what it actually is but we're in an epidemic of narcissism that's reinforcing itself yeah that's what you're saying a spiral right this yeah is- so again let's get there all right so we got arrogance versus humility we have receptivity or hyper rejection of criticism back to genuine self-esteem All right, you do something, you get feedback, you might vigorously resist it, but at some point, you have the sublime capacity to admit of the possibility of the need or desire for improvement. In other words, rather than clinging to an idealized image, you subscribe to a conception of yourself that is potentially improvable and subject to development. You know, I'll I'll never forget our book, The Worm at the Core. We may have talked about this, but we wrote the book. I wrote a lot of it. I thought what I wrote is great. I send it to the editor. We don't hear anything. 
for almost a year. It may have been six months, but it was at least six months. It may have been a year. And then I get a paragraph. We get an email, and the editor writes to us, and he's like, you know, I'm so sorry that it's taken me so long. I started reading your book, and I fell asleep in the first paragraph, and I just woke up, And which was wow. his way of saying, your book is a non-pharmacological intervention for insomnia. If you want to write this, then you should write it for an academic journal or a university press. We agreed that you were to produce a book that might be comprehensible and engaging to a larger audience. Well, my original reaction was to hop over to fucking Walmart. Screw you, dude. Buy a machine gun uh, and, uh, you know, take him out as well as the entire floor uh, of the publishing house. But I'm not proud of that reaction, but that was. And then it took me a while to be like, fuck, this guy is an accomplished editor. And looking at what we did, he's right. And so, okay, so let's leave it at that. Finally, and this is where Hornite gets, in my opinion, just really profoundly important as well as clinically correct. She says, look, what drives the behavior of the narcissist is the need to preserve the grandiose impression of themselves. And therefore, Everything they do must be viewed in that regard, or everything they don't do, and that they will systematically avoid at all costs any engagement with other people or reality that might undermine their impressions of themselves. All right, so back to my days at Skidmore. I get to Skidmore, and there's this arrogant son of a bitch who was on the tennis team, and he used to wear a fucking headband, and you know, the things on your wrists, and he'd come in, like, bouncing a fucking tennis ball on a racket. Beyond Bork. Yeah, (laughs) I was back in the day. Jimmy Connors, Bork, Chris Everett. And he'd be like, come on, uh, let's play tennis. I'll kick your ass. I'll play left-handed if you want. And the fact is, is the guy was very good. And he could beat anybody at Skidmore. All right, but in Schenectady, right by where Saratoga is, you know, half an hour from Saratoga, there's a pro-am tennis tournament every year back in the day uh, where Bork and Jimmy Connors and McEnroe and I can't remember who the women were back in the day, uh, Martina, Nervatilova, Chris Everett, doesn't really matter. The pros would come, and if you were an amateur tennis player, you could go get your ass kicked by the best. And so every year, other students at Skidmore would say to this guy, you know, are you going to the tournament? And every year, he'd be like, yeah, yeah. And then the tournament would happen. They'd be like, how'd it go? And he'd be like, oh, I couldn't go. My mom died. The next year, my dad died. The next year, my, my mom dog died. died. Again. <laughs> the next year, my mom's dog died. And so the point is, is that this guy would just avoid at all costs. All right, well, the counterpoint, let's say you have genuine self-regard. I'm going to put Ken on the spot here. We, sh- we need you to play some songs because Ken is a great guitarist and a wonderful songwriter. If I said to you, Ken, who's your favorite guitarist, who would you say? Just guitarist? Yeah, or I mean, even songwriter. Let's yeah, say. I mean, now, I grew give me up f- with James Taylor and okay, Paul so if, Simon. And- if James Taylor or Paul Simon were to be here, are they better guitarists than you? I don't know. All right. Who is a better guitarist than you? Almost anybody. Good. (laughs) And so let's say that you had the opportunity to play with almost anybody. Would you sit down with a guitar with them or would you pretend to break a string so you had to go to mobile for coffee? Well, I'd be quiet and let them show me what to... But you'd still be delighted to partake of something that you love in the presence oh. of those that you know are demonstrably superior. It would make Even my... if you realize I will never in a fucking million years be this good, you still see it as an inspired opportunity to co-mingle with the best. And are in no way put off by their excellence. No. So 
I feel very strongly about sitting here with you in that way. Fuck that. But that, <laughs> but that's a, but that, that's a, that, that's a fact. No, no, all right. Well, that's, that's, that's a no, fact. That, look, that's awesome, and I'm super appreciative. But you know, so back to me for a second to be momentarily narcissistic. It's like sometimes when I am reading a book by somebody who's alive and it's excellent, I'm like, God damn it. Lord, if you hear me, would you just send a thunderbolt down to that person's house and fucking incinerate them so that their ideas do not intrude upon mine? I, other times I'm like, God, I wish I could meet that person. Yeah. It would be awesome to say that if I could write a single sentence like you, uh, my life would be through. So this gets back to the overriding point, which is I think there's a touch of narcissist in all of us, but it's a matter of where we are on the continuum. I Back to you now, Steve, though, which is, okay, why is it that narcissism, which has always been around, it's a psychological condition, There's that human nature probably hasn't changed much, but... Why is it that throughout most of human history, the pathological narcissist uh, would be left out on a rock to die when the rest of the tribe picks up and, and takes off while the guy's still sleeping? You know, was it last night we were talking about the proverbial indigenous peoples, often referred to as primitive, but that word has a pejorative sense, but... In most societies, until recently, the person who said, I'm the best, fuck the rest, was usually seen as a a dangerous menace. And a lot of those kinds of societies are constructed such that the heroic individual is the one who shows the most persistent devotion to the good of the group. I think, Ken, you were talking about hunting and how When there was a great catch, the hunter who bagged the big animal, no, they didn't get the first choice of the prime cut. They would get what's left over after everyone else had been uh, satisfied. That was the self-esteem associated with the kill. That's right. It wasn't what we do here. There you go. It was almost a religious, like it was something you would learn in church, like that you take care of the other guys first. That's and right. And if there's anything left over for you. So his greatest reward was bringing this back and bestowing the bounty on his fellow people. Yeah, there you go. So and note, though, that even though these so-called primitive peoples don't have any explicit sociology or anthropology or even psychology... That, that's built on the assumption of an uber-social, mutually independent set of individuals mm-hmm. incapable of surviving in the absence of uh, that kind of supportive and cooperative behavior. Which is true of us today. It's true of but us. But it's not apparent good because you don't see that person Brilliant. who grew the food good. that you're buying. You don't see the person who's making the electricity possible to light your home and and power the internet. Yeah. They're just faceless, nameless entities, but you don't even think of them as people sometimes. They're just part of this machine that goes on. And so it's you and all this stuff. Good. So there again, Steve, brilliant. And it raises the question, how did we get to the point where we have degenerated into essentially autistic, self-absorbed monads. But not only that, because we're cultural critics, right? We, we, we declared that. ourselves we that, that, and that's cul- what you have to do. Yeah. We're Just declare critics. it so. Yes. So, so we look at it and go, you go online, you look up narcissism on the internet, and you see all these articles on, you don't want to date a narcissist. Because they're very charming and very attractive at first, but then it turns out that they're manipulative, and then it's all about them, and they really lack empathy. So you're not going to have a satisfying relationship, so don't date a narcissist. And I think to myself, well, that's probably good advice. It sure is. But what you're saying basically is they're annoying, right? Their narcissists are annoying. But what we're saying is collective narcissism is more than annoying, 
it's dangerous. Yeah. What is the concern? Where where are we as a society struggling with this epidemic of narcissism, this lionization of the narcissist as the be all and end all of the human species when in fact traditionally we eschewed them and yeah. now we're living with the narcissist in chief yep. at the head of a gigantic collection of narcissists who seem to be very happy with him and his ilk. I think it's important to point out a lot of people are blaming stuff on the narcissist in chief. And I can't remember who said it, but uh, people generally evolves to get the leadership that they deserve. I think that was and Barack I, Obama who said, in a yeah. democracy, you get the leader you deserve. Yeah. And Trump is as much a, a symptom. A symptom. Yeah. People voted for that guy. That's the thing you got to look at. And will again. And yeah. will again. And think that he's doing a great job. Well, uh, for the reasons that we've already articulated, here's where we need Jean Lippman Blumen talking about leadership, where she just says, you can't understand leaders and followers. You can't separate them. We've got to see them in terms of a dynamic interplay. And so the narcissist in chief, be it Trump or any other narcissistic leader, wouldn't be able to get up in the morning without the affirmation of their supporters. Maybe we could do this at another moment, but I believe that one of the reasons why President Trump is literally almost berserk every day is he has been denied his psychological heroin, uh, which are the rallies. Right, and, and, right. And, and I see him like flailing because of that. And you remember his, he said there's never been so many people at an inauguration. That's correct. And then they show camera shots yep. and it's like, you don't need <laughs> yep. you, you don't need to count just you can pull up a half a dozen yep. where the, there's 10 times as many people but it didn't stop him from declaring it no moreover it didn't stop about i have to look this up it's in the washington post they did a great poll right after the inauguration where they showed people pictures of the obama inauguration oh, yeah. and the trump one and they just said which has more people and a, a shocking, like, 20% of Trump supporters said that the Trump picture had more people. Reality is no match Secondary. Uh, for a narcissistically self-inflated delusion. But then the other point is, so you, the narcissist needs the people. And collective narcissists, they need the head narcissist to keep showering them with accolades in order for them to manage their persistent insecurities. All right, but back to history, because you keep raising the question, what is it about this moment? Why are we saying with a straight face that there's an epidemic of narcissism? Why are we saying that that in turn uh, has downstream consequences? Super important because there's always been narcissism. So what's what's happened? And the, again, classic comic book argument is it goes back to political philosophy. So you've got basically the Socrates and Plato argument, which is, while thousands of years old, I believe to ultimately be closer to the truth, whatever that is. And that is that we are uber social creatures. So you have Plato writing about Socrates saying, none of us could survive on our own. We are here because of the mutual benefits that are accrued by virtue of being members of a community. And that we are therefore obligated to the community without which we would be unable to exist in the first place. So that's one, you said yesterday, Steve, that there's always this tension between the individual and the society. Looking for a balance. And looking for a balance because, and the, the, the Greeks knew this, that there was always going to be tension between rights and responsibilities. And as you know, and it is- And, a, and look, at, look at where we're at in the pandemic- 
yep. where you'll see a woman stand up at a town hall meeting and say, there's nothing in the Constitution that says I have to wear a mask. Yep. And How dare you tell me I have to wear a mask? Yep. There's someone who's just not thinking about the right thoughts. They're well, also, yeah, they're also... In the moment. No, because they're concerned about their liberty. Yeah, correct. Your, your liberty's not worth as much if you're dead. No, 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 yeah. no. Give me liberty or give me death. Liberty is all important to the libertarian mind. Yeah, but doesn't this almost fall into the you can't yell fire in a crowded theater? But if you're a libertarian, if you're an Ayn Randian libertarian, you believe that if you take care of yourself and Sheldon takes care of himself and I take care of myself, we don't have to worry about the collective good. We don't have to worry about the common good. Everybody takes care of themselves. That flies in the face of the situation we find ourselves in. Absolutely it does. So you've got to take in some new information sometimes. Well, even libertarians use the highways when they need to go to the store. So, that you know, fuck that, basically. (laughs) Okay. All right. So we got the ancient Greeks. They're like, we're social creatures. We have obligations to society because without it, we wouldn't be here. All right. It's fine. I think, sorry to uh, jump in, but I think that was a really important point where he just said, we have an obligation to the society because we need the society to be ourselves. Yeah, without this, it, this without is it, really we important. Don't, we don't really, that's really important. Yeah, because moreover, if you accept that assumption, then the idea that there's anything uh, remotely resembling a natural right that is not coincidentally and explicitly connected to the responsibilities that provide for that right to arise in the first place, is you're missing the point. Even John Locke, who we're going to talk about right now, points out that there's no such thing as an unencumbered right in a civil society. So, you know, again, we need like five minutes of the Locke dude in order to get to Ronald Reagan, in order to get to today. Because here's the fucking Locke, 1690, second treatise on government. And what Locke is trying desperately to do, and the guy's a genius, what he wants to do is to get us out of centuries of despotic rule by divine right. Basically, back in the day, the idea of individual rights was inconceivable. The idea of an individual was inconceivable. You know, everything was top-down, and that was all. You were born into a social role, and then that was the end of it. So Locke, what he does is to say that that's not a natural state of affairs. And he says, let's go back And think about the way people were in a state of nature. And he just says, in a state of nature, there are no societies. There's just individuals, which he defined, an individual is a guy with their family and their property. So in nature, there's no societies. There's just people striving to survive. And... What he's doing there is he wants to establish the primacy of the individual over the obligation to society. And he admits, by the way, like all geniuses do, that if he's wrong in that assumption that the rest of his argument falls apart. And of course, he is wrong in that assumption. It is one of the few unambiguously incorrect ideas in the history of social science. Unless you're talking about the farmer living out on the prairie alone with absolutely. his family. No, yeah, but, a- absolutely. But, but if you're that, talking about hunter-gatherers working collectively for survival, exactly, then his idea is total nonsense. No, that's correct. And of course, that's what he's using as the model, is the farmer kind of out there by themselves. So he says, okay, so why then do we have societies? Well, He says we have societies because in a state of nature, everyone's trying to survive and you have a right to self-preservation. Well, but if I'm hungry and I see an apple tree a mile away, well, I could walk over and grab an apple. But if I see Ken six feet away from me with an apple in his hand, it'd be so much easier to grab a rock and crack your fucking head and take that apple. 
And then he's like, yeah, but in nature, it's tit for tat. If I take Ken's apple, well, he has the right to respond in a retaliatory fashion in proportion to the magnitude of the transgression and the service of reparation and discouraging future transgressions. I think I have the right to defend my apple in the first place. You do. That's correct. And Not I, wait for you to take it. Try to keep you from taking there it. There you go. All right. Now, in a rational universe, if it were an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, well, it would be fine. We would work it out. But humans being humans, if I steal Ken's apple, he's going to kill my dog. And then I'm going to kidnap his wife, and then you're going to burn down my village. And, and he, you have a blood feud that lasts several generations. There you go. And so basically Locke following, what's the fucking Levinthian guy, Hobbes, he's just like, we would be in a permanent state of war. It would be chaos and anarchy. So Locke says there came a point where humans said, let us reluctantly relinquish our right to do anything that we want, including punishing people who transgress against us for the safety and security that arises when we form a civil society. Which Jared Diamond writes about. That's when correct. He talks about Papua New Guinea. Absolutely. This is when the most important thing about bringing laws and police to a society is it takes away the pervasive fear of being murdered. That's correct. For transgressions that happened 20, 50 years ago. Yes. Right. So it's quite brilliant. I believe it to be true. And that is that what we get when we enter civil society is an exchange. You are relinquishing freedom in return for security that would not exist otherwise. Okay, so then... And that's a great thing to do. It is an important thing to do. It's one of the best things in the history of Earth. Is civilization. The, civilization. Yeah, for that reason. And so, but here's Locke. And Locke, though, he felt very strongly that government should do as little as possible. And specifically, that all government should do is to ensure domestic tranquility and ward off foreign invaders so that individuals could pursue the acquisition of property. Boy, does this sound like Ronald Reagan if anyone, all the way up to there Mitch you, There McConnell. you go, Steve. So yeah. my point, if anyone from Reagan on, anyone from Milton Friedman on, whenever you hear what they're saying, you need to realize that they're just, they're parroting Locke. But we have to listen to Locke, though. Because he, was, he was the word for 150 years. And still. No, it's still very much with us. And this is why a lot of our concerns about, I don't disagree at all, rampant economic insecurity is what is arguably putting us in the most vulnerable position right now in terms of instability with the possible exception of the pandemic and the incoming environmental apocalypse. But we need to understand why it's going to be such a tough nut to tackle politically. So back to Locke. He's like, okay, what about property? And because, and then Locke, because he has uh, integrity, he's like, wait a minute, there's no property in the Bible. No private property in the Bible. In fact, the Bible, Jesus is a communist. The Bible says that God provided nature for all of us to use, and we all have an equal right to it. We should emphasize that for our friends that purport to embrace biblical values. Uh, there is, uh, there, uh, we should just read them the Sermon on the Mount once in a, a while. A, any of those things. Blessed but, are the but, meek, you know. But that so one. John Locke starts with an accurate recognition of the fundamental equality of everybody as well as our right to survive. And so he says, okay, there is no property in the Bible, but... Surely, natural law is such that you have a right to live. So he's going with both the Bible, there's no property, 
but just common sense. It's, a, it's actually pre-Darwin, so this is 1690, and it's very Darwinian. You have a right to self-preservation. And then he's like, well, you don't own anything really, but couldn't we say that you own your body? And this is really important because it's hard to argue with that. Although truth be told, and a story for another time is like, no, not everybody grants that because if you're on your body, then suicide should be acceptable. But let's forget about that for the or moment. Or pregnancy. Yeah, or any yeah. of those things. Yeah. But or, he's or like, terminating a pregnancy. Yeah, so like, he's like, clearly. all right. Um, yeah, or that can. He's like, you own, uh, you own your body. And then, okay, and this is important. I'm being pedantic because it's really my thought these days is it's time for those of us who give a shit to go back and explore these ideas and recognize them for their time and place so that we can extract their value. The nuggets you know, of goodness. Yeah, you said yesterday, Ken, that it's we got to get beyond our current back and forth. And I think I told you guys, if I don't stroke out, I want to write a book called Why Left and Right Are Both Beside the Point. We need to understand that there is merit abstractly to conservative viewpoints in particular circumstances, as well as the more liberal ones. That's why John Locke, ironically, was called a liberal philosopher at first, because he was liberating the individuals from the yoke of divine submission. But then now he's considered conservative because he's all about the unbridled pursuit of property being natural, necessary, and good for everybody. All right, so back to Locke. He's like, all right, I own my body, and by extension, I own whatever my body does in order to advance my prospect for staying alive. All right, so if there's an apple tree in the middle of a field, that's anybody's apples. But if I walk over and I exert effort to grab an apple, the minute it's in my hand, my labor has transformed that apple from a common good to my private property. All right? And at that point, another person has no right to take that from me. If they're hungry, they should get their own apple. All right, and I like that example because I like apples. <laughs> and then he says, well, all right, well, how much property can you have? And his answer is, you can have as much as you legitimately acquire by virtue of honest effort, as long as, one, you don't in the process deny other people an opportunity to do the same, and two, that you don't take more than you can use. Wow. And so wow. that's a big one. It's a <laughs> that's fucking a huge, huge one. one. I'm like, read that fucking thing. Because he's like, that's a sin. Because in fact, if you take more apples than you're going to use, you're letting something spoil that other people might have otherwise taken advantage of. And see, this is why these points are really important. And so he's like, if you want to put a fence around an apple tree... That's your apple tree. Hmm. If you want to put a fucking fence around Nebraska, then you own Nebraska. But think about this, because John Locke does. He is assuming a world that is infinitely large and infinitely rich. Hmm. Because he says, well, England's pretty full, but if you want to have some land, go to America. It's empty. There's nobody there There's but nobody a few there. savages. Yeah, 20 million savages. So, but, yeah. so note, though, that in a world that has never existed, but that in principle, if every one of us could be successful in proportion to the effort that we expend. So remember the old days in the 1950s or 1960s, if you were a white guy and you wanted a job, what did you used to do? You went and applied for a job. Good. And you because got, you, you looked you, in the yeah, fucking yeah. newspaper, yeah. there were hundreds of jobs. Yeah. You went and got one, even minimum wage, 
who could provide enough income that you could have an apartment. And if you were persistent, you could move up the proverbial food chain. I'm just talking about white men in certain settings. But if that's the case, then I'm a Republican. In a perfect universe uh, where effort is rewarded in proportion to what one expends, and if there's enough resources to go around, yeah, then you get yours and I'll get mine and everything's fine. All right, so here's where it gets funky, though. Locke is brilliant because he says, look, in the old days, things could be fairly stable. You know, I've got a shit ton of apples. You've got a shit ton of cows. My apples are going to rot. Your cows are going to die. So you give me a fucking cow and I'll take some bushels of apples and we're even. Moreover, there would come a point where you don't need any more apples or you don't need any more cows. That reality would be the upper limit. And he said all of that changed with the invention of money. And again, it's brilliant. But he's not taking into account the symbolic nature of he, he is of now. stuff. So that's correct. So basically, early on, and he's wrong, by the way, because we've always been concerned about the symbolic nature. But right. it's a nice tale, because his point is, is that anything that's natural is of finite duration, and there's an upper limit to how much you want. So basically, you can have enough apples, you can have enough cows. But once you've got money, he's like, what's the difference between money and a cow? He's like, two things. One is you can't eat money. And two is money doesn't die. And so here he is hundreds of years before the Freud makes the scene, identifying what's at stake. And that is money lives forever. And then he says, well, once there's money, and here's the critical point, once there's money, which doesn't rot, you can now have as much money as you want because you do no disservice. He even used the words, he uses the word hoarding. He says you can hoard as much money as you want, and that's perfectly fine because you're, nothing is rotting. And you do no disservice to your fellow humans in your pursuit of property. Now, that claim happens to be both disputable yeah, and wrong, right. but this is what Locke is saying. Right? And then from there, and we're almost done and we can climb into the present, Locke says, look, people are different. They vary in industry. That's the word that he used. And in those days, industry was a combination of ability and effort, mm -hmm. right? Some people are smarter than others. Some people are, Have a better work ethic. are less lazy than others. Those people will inevitably get more. And over time, there will be vast inequality in terms of the distribution of property. And that's fucking great. Uh, it is natural. And what's great in this is, you know, Andrew Carnegie and the, it's basically the rising tide lifts all boats, that you're going to have some genuinely creative and able individuals. They're going to change things in pursuit of their riches and property that's going to make everybody better off. And the point is that, well, there's a few points. One is, is that there's some truth to that. Even Marx acknowledged that a byproduct of capitalism is innovation and creativity. But if you fast forward now to where we are, here's Christopher Lash writing in 1979, The Culture of Narcissism. Here's Reagan getting elected in 1980 basically embracing the Ivan Bosky idea that greed is good. Well, what happened? Well, what happened is, according to Ernest Becker, Locke's ideas won, and any quaint ideas about being fundamentally social creatures who have responsibilities to our fellow citizens which, by the way, those ideas were buttressed by, as you pointed out yesterday, Steve, 
classical religious views that stressed the value of compassion and cooperation. So here you have Ernest Becker saying, people have always been people. We've always been narcissistic. We've always wanted to have a lot of money and stuff. But that greed and propensity to selfish and narcissistic behavior was always counterbalanced by our subscription to the Judeo-Christian worldview that checked our less noble impulses by saying, don't do that. And the 18th century idea that there was such a thing or could be such a thing as democracy. Yes. Which means we are all equal, at least in the eyes of the law. Yes. We're all equal. We all have equal rights. And that also mitigated this greed and drive to own the continent from sea to shining sea. Yes. ours. And that was tempered by religion yep. and democracy. And now we see the waning of religion, yep. at least the power of religion, which some people, of course, will dispute, but I think it's pretty apparent that we no longer live the way the pilgrims did or That's the way right. they did in the Middle Ages. Religion is something that you know you give lip service on Sundays, and the rest of the time you think about money. That's you right. Think about money like... 20 times a day, and you think about religion once a week. And then the other part of it, democracy, is under attack. Because yes. like what you're saying is this acquisition of stuff, money and stuff, has created this radical income inequality. Yep. At least we've returned to the days of the robber barons where we had radical income inequality, and that is undermining democracy. Yeah, we're, that's we're creating a plutocracy. Yeah, that's and as, right. And as your favorite historian Jacques Barzin predicts, we're going to have a society of oligarchs and peasants, a vast class of people who can neither read nor count. And you look at the assault We've already on got a lot of that. Yeah. Oh no, I Yeah. You look at the assault on education, public education. I mean, the libertarians would eliminate public education. Yeah, I know. Well, I love the poorly educated. So there's Trump's There you go. Uh, Yeah. So back to Becker for a second, because his point in the money, the new immortality ideology chapter in Escape from Evil, and none of this is conspiratorial. There was no one sitting on a throne saying, let's do this. His point is just the Nietzsche one, that in the 1800s, the power of collective religious beliefs was diminished in response to Darwin, the Industrial Industrial Revolution, Revolution. and the Enlightenment. So here you have a situation where the power of God is waning because you have people saying, let's build a machine that flies, and then we fucking did it. So... The Becker point is that we became a more secular culture, but we did not become less religious. Rather, we don't worship God so much as we worship money. That our insatiable pursuit of money and stuff is driven ultimately by the same death anxiety that is the impetus for embracing religion in the first place. And anyone that disputes that, look on the back of a dollar bill where you're like, in God we trust. And then look at the pyramid to the left of that with the eyeball floating up top, which is an ancient Egyptian symbol of immortality. And then look at the terror management studies where if you remind people that they're going to die, they say they need more money. They are more eager to buy stuff that conveys high status. They, if you ask them to draw a picture of money, they draw the coins and bills bigger. bigger. And then my favorite one, if you give people a stack of money to count, not to keep, just to count, death anxiety goes down from just having money in your hand. Just being close to it. Just being in physical contact with money. So... Here you have money and stuff we know diminishes death anxiety. And then Ronald Reagan ushers in the era of John Locke on steroids. 
It is ultimately an explicit denunciation of the idea of society and community. Greed is good. I'm the best and fuck the rest. And so two things happened, it is claimed. One is is that that is an extraordinarily alienating and lonely world to live in. We return to the Lockean view of the basic unit of humanity being the individual unencumbered by social connections, noting that that's a complete perversion of psychological reality. It is by virtue of our social connections that we could ever be an independent individual to begin with. Except that the social connections in this era, in this day and age, are not apparent. That's correct. Yeah. I don't know who built the street out there. No, yeah. I don't know who built this building. I don't know where my coffee came from. I don't even know what continent it came from. Yes. Let alone what people produced it. Yeah. I don't know any of that. Yep. I know me and the few people in my orbit. Yep. But really, the enterprise is so huge and yeah. impersonal. How can you not feel like, well, it's me yep. and the rest of it? Well, that's the uh, one of the profound points in that Hannah Arendt book on fascism. What's the origin of totalitarianism? She says, look, totalitarianism is it's one part racism and it is another part imperialism and the third part is the pursuit of unlimited wealth that is no longer tied to the production of anything tangible. And it's quite, she says that's the that's the cause of totalitarianism. Yeah, she says that the inevitable result of that dynamic is fascism. That and her argument, which is intriguing, is that what really we have to pay attention to is the moment in time where finance became tied more to abstractions than to producing anything in particular. And that what's driving this is ultimately the pursuit of an abstraction. But anyway, so we got, we got Reagan, we've got Thatcher saying, greed is good, you're on your own, let's all just get as much as we can. And getting back to narcissism, yep. Well, that's you're the, describing this cowboy actor, that's Hollywood correct, Hollywood movie actor. Yeah, I don't know that much about Thatcher, but Reagan, I remember vividly. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of narcissism built into that. Yeah, and and so you've got Reagan promoting this whole concept of small government and lower taxes, and as if all those people dependent on that government, yep. on the largesse of the government, as most people my age are, in retirement or semi-retirement, Medicare and Social Security are vital. But they're saying, no, no, we want to cut that down. We want to cut back on it. We want to make the government so small you can drown it in a bathtub. We want to cut taxes yet again. And that was what Reagan's message was, and yeah. everyone went, yeah. Because, again, it's pure John Locke. It, yeah, it's not but, the proper function. And, and it's Friedman. Uh, it's Milton Friedman. It's, well, but yeah, Milton's, yeah, again, yeah. he's a Locke guy. Right, right. Although, again, to give Milton credit, he's a fucking Nazi. But if you read him, he's like, the proper function of business is to make money. The proper function of government is to do what's best for people. It's not business's job to behave in a morally upright fashion. It's government's job to ensure that that happens. Now, so what happens when business buys the government? That well, that therein lies the problem. So that's already problem. happened. So I'm right. not defending Friedman so right. much as pointing out that it, he has integrity, even if I disagree. But all right, one more point, Stephen, and then we can bounce it back and forth. But because that's the I think we were talking about this last night, and that is that once we shift to an individually oriented state of affairs where you are now measured by what you have rather than what you do, so it creates an unstable spiral of 
the insatiable pursuit of money and stuff that renders everybody perpetually apprehensive and insecure. Because if the goal is to be a decent human, like in the most religious traditions, if I'm a king, so be it. If I'm a potato farmer, and if I'm the best potato farmer that I can be, that's good enough for God. But in a market-driven universe, there's only one standard, and that's who's got the most. Who's got the most money? Who's got the most stuff? And Becker is profound when he just says that there's no steady state. There's always an increasing psychological arms race. What were you saying? Bezos has how many billions? 143. Yeah, well, you can know for sure that there's some Turk, or I mean, that young punk, let's say, in India or China or even the U.S. or Mexico saying that's, that's chump change. Yeah. I'll beat that. So, the, and the point is enough is never enough. Everyone is always a potential competitor for the amounts of self-regard that we now need. So here we have a situation where all of us who are prone to being narcissistic from time to time are thrust into a world where our genuine self-regard is now predicated on adhering to values that are not realistically attainable by most of us. And so that has the pernicious effect of rendering us right now a society of unhappy, unrelated. In the very real sense, you said it earlier, Steve, we no longer recognize that we're still fundamentally social creatures that are interdependent upon each other. Yeah, but we don't realize that anymore. Uh, uh, Not to sound like Father Time, but in the old days, you could ask anybody to draw a map of their neighborhood and tell you who lived in every house, and they would say that. They would know. Most of my students don't know who their neighbors are. You knew the person that sold you the bread that delivered the milk or brought the newspaper, and you were able to realize that uh, you're the beneficiary of their efforts. That's one of Marx's finest points. But hold on to one thing. That we just go, go back yeah. one paragraph. We, having read Becker, having been in, engaged in these ideas for quite a while, we looked at mental health yeah. as, and especially the problems that this society faces, our American mental health, has been deteriorating, and we looked at that as a result of what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay, you've got the rise of economic inequality, and you've got the limited opportunities for self-esteem and heroism in this secular culture, and so mental health, depression, stress, addiction, all of those were considered maladies as a result. But we started this conversation talking about narcissism, which is a mental health concern. And we're saying, yes, that might be a malady, but it's also now a concern, a cause, or something that's at least a multiplier of the problems that we're experiencing. And the economic inequality can, in many ways, be looked at as a result of the collective narcissism and individual narcissism yeah. that our society now is, is experiencing on epidemic levels. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think that's the crux of the issue is psychobabble that we're now in the middle of a fucking death spiral where we've got a culture that nudges us in the direction of self-encapsulated monads that are effectively detached from our fellow humans, yearning for self-regard that is not likely to be attained 
through traditional channels. Let's face it, most of us are not going to be uber rich, uber attractive, or uber young. And so what choice does one have but to be a legend in one's own mind? I don't have as much money as Bill Gates, but i got a thousand Facebook friends. You could be a legend on and, YouTube. Yeah. Uh, also, I can't help but notice that, you know, Taylor Swift has an Instagram, but I want a stuffed animal at the carnival. So, of course, i got to put that on, on Instagram. On, on Instagram. my Facebook page, right? Yeah. And, and so... Getting to what you were talking about in a minute, Steve, but I do think that this is important. We are now at a point in our world where, ironically, people would be incapable of functioning for more than a day or two without the devices that allow them to reflect themselves upon themselves for almost every waking moment. Because one of the things, and I'm not I don't mean this as a pejorative indictment of the youth because they've inherited the world that we fucking gave them, but actual experiences no longer matter until they're documented and have become virtual reality, reality itself. So when you go to like fill in the blank and you see people gazing at the Grand Canyon, but they're not fucking looking at it. They're looking at it through their, through their devices phone. right? because the experience itself is secondary to the way that they choreograph it for future presentations. The fact is, is that I do like the point that what that has done is ironically maybe rendered people less anxious, but not happy. You're never going to have enough money and stuff. And your life has been reduced to goddamn Jim Carrey film where uh, you're in the middle of your own made-for-cable-TV drama where you're the reality TV star. But more to your point, Steve, and I do think we need more attention to this because we can talk endlessly about narcissism as an unfortunate state of psychological affairs that adversely impacts individuals. We could also note that narcissists fucking throw cement necklaces around all of the people that are near them. They, they, they bring the worst out in all of us with their relentless demands for our attention and approval. But I think the important point is the one that you make, and that is that narcissists and their behavior have consequential effects on social forces that we don't attend to. We see narcissism as the outcome of an unfortunate pattern right. of institutional activity, and we need to flip that. Yes. Uh, and you know, we, so we need to go Escher. It's not a duck or a rabbit. It's like both. And now let's look at the other side. We've been talking with Sheldon Solomon about narcissism and how it relates to economic inequality. Important ideas, Steve. I agree. Fascinating subjects. In part three, we look again at opportunities for hope. So please join us next time. Like us on Facebook. Please recommend us to your friends. You can find us at www.thehubforimportantideas.com. And support us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash thehubimportantideas. We are 100% listener supported. Thank you for listening to The Hub for Important Ideas. I'm Steve James. And I'm Ken Swain. Stay safe, everybody. Stay well.